Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the USF Black Alumni Society in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center as we are about to begin our My Health virtual series. We'll get started in one minute. Thank you guys for joining. We'll get started in one minute. Thank you guys for joining. Welcome to our My Health series in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center. The USF Black Alumni Society would like to welcome you. We'll get started in a few more minutes. Thank you everyone for joining our virtual health series today sponsored by Moffitt Cancer Center. The USF Black Alumni Society would like to thank everyone for joining and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome our moderator, Lisa Mifflin, who will introduce our two panelists. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our My Health series. And so I first want to, you know, everyone relax. We're gonna have a great conversation today. And I want to first introduce Dr. Edmundo Robinson, Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Innovation Officer for Moffitt. And we also, so welcome Dr. Robinson and also welcome back Dr. Blue, who is hematologist oncologist specializing in blood and marrow transplant at Moffitt. And so, like I said, great conversation. So grab a snack, grab your coffee, grab your tea, and we're gonna have a good discussion. So I'm gonna start off with a question for you, Dr. Robinson. So. You know, when we talk about innovation and medicine, and let's just jump into the discussion about the digital divide, particularly in healthcare, as the world has gone digital, there is a concern of access to digital technology for lower income communities, rural communities. And so what does that mean in terms of being able to maximize healthcare? So, you know, it's a, it's a great, great question, Lisa. So you think about it in all the rest of, of uh, all the other industries, right, are going digital, right? Whether it's, whether it's retail, whether it's, you know, um, uh, you think about uh, the food, you think about delivery services and the restaurant business, especially with the pandemic, um, you know, even education, right, is, is, is moving a lot in a lot of ways in that way, you know, with the pros and cons that come with all this. Healthcare has been slowly, but now accelerating with the, with the pandemic toward the same uh, end of, of really going digital. What does that mean? It means, you know, that your interactions and your engagements with those that, that are caring for your healthcare team are increasingly going to be digital, increasingly going to be mobile, online, um, even voice, right? Remote patient monitoring, wearables, Fitbits, the whole thing. That's where things are going. And so the question really here is, who do we leave behind? If that happens, right? And, and, and is that in that and, and is and for this for this community? What what does that mean for your community? Um, and 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 are there very specific and pointed ways that we should be thinking about addressing um, who gets left, who potentially gets left behind, right? So if you think about, uh, for example, um, COVID, and you think about the disproportionate effect it's had on certain communities versus others. And then you think about what happened in Texas and, 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 and think about the fact that the electricity, you know, folks just didn't have power. And, but the disproportionate effect that that had on certain communities versus others, whose power went out first and whose power came back first, right? Um, and so the same thing could potentially happen when you think about digital, you think about the idea that, you know, the way you're gonna access your doctors is, is gonna be digital. The way you're gonna have access to your, to even your interventions are gonna be digital. And then who do we who do we leave behind? So so you know I, I there there's there there really I think should be um, some concern. I think this group that's on this on this call on this Zoom uh, meeting should should really be thinking about what that might mean for the for the folks that that you guys are are concerned about. Yeah, and, and Dr. Blue, I'll just ask you you know as a as a practitioner, 
where do you see this challenge in the work you're doing? Yeah, you know, um, not only am I a practitioner, but I'm a father, you know, I'm a son to uh, uh, parents who are elderly. So, you know, uh, when this pandemic hit, you know, my son had to do um, like virtual learning. Fortunately, we had the opportunity to be able to do that, but not everybody's so fortunate. What do you do to the kid who don't have internet? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do to the kid who doesn't have the iPad or the computers and those kind of things to talk about? And then you flip it to the other side. Now my parents are older. And then now, it's, you know, they're setting their ways. Okay. And so now they're having to go to a televisit. And, you know, even if they had the money to do it, my parents are like, I, you know, they, they, they have trouble finding the own button on the computer, you know. And so now you're telling them to navigate through Zoom and some of these platforms. So I, I, I think there's certain... Um, just disparities in certain groups that just, you know, it kind of came so sudden, you know what I mean? Some people were already kind of prepared, but, but if you had never really thought that you had to do a television, could you say, what do you mean? I always go into the bank. What, why would I need to learn how to bank online? Like, what do you mean? I just talked to the teller and now you see banks are going away. Right. right. So they're kind of, but this forced it uh, kind of at a very rapid speed. And so um, we see it not only in the healthcare, but we see it really in all walks of life. Yeah. Uh, and so this, can I follow up on that? So Dr. Blue brought up a really good point. So I, I'm glad he brought up banking, right? So I have, I have a, I have a little, I have a tiny little story. And my, my, my team knows that I, I always have these stories. They're always random. I'm going to tell you a random tiny little story. So I remember uh, my grandmother um, going to the bank with my grandmother. And at the time, the, the uh, automated teller machines, ATMs had just come out. But my grandmother was not going to use that machine. If she needed $20, she was going to go inside and wait in line and talk to the teller and get her $20. And I would tell my grandmother, you can just get the $20. Nope, she's not using that machine. She's going in and she's going to talk to somebody. And now I'll tell you, I haven't been inside of a bank in years. Um, and so I, don't, I, even, I even take a picture of my checks. And that's how I deposit. If you send me a physical check, which is old school, but if I get a physical check, I will take a picture and deposit. I will not go into the bank. Right. And so there's there, there is there is there is a divide from that perspective in terms of, I think, to Dr. Blue's point, um, certain ages um, might are going to tend one way or the other. But there's actually research on this. So here's the thing. Digital is a tool. It can, if used improperly, exacerbate disparities. But it actually can, if used well, eliminate, help eliminate disparities. And it's really a matter of how thoughtful we are about using it as a tool. So here's, here's some of the research that's done. There's a really, really smart researcher out in, um, at, at UCSF in San Francisco. And she's looked at this, this idea of, of who actually engages with digital tools in healthcare. And what she's found, one of the things that she's found is that um, it actually depends on how you design the tool. So to, to Dr. Blue's point, if you don't design for people who aren't technologically native, they're not millennial, they're not, you know, this next generation Gen Z, I'm not sure who's, who's next, but, you know, they're not, if they're not in that generation, if you don't design for everyone to access it, then they won't use it because they can't find the button, right? They don't know how to use it, right? But if you make it really easy, when I, to, to, you know, Dr. Blue's got a, got a, got a seven-year-old, when I, when I, when I, when I um, if I open up an iPhone, I, and, and my, my seven-year-old wants to use it, I've never had to give her instructions on how to use an iPhone. You know why? Because now, again, she's young, but because it's designed so simply that you just swipe and you just point and you just hit some stuff and, and it, something works, right? And so it's, it's really a lot. Some of it is about design. Some of it, though, is just about the underlying social and economic infrastructure in the U.S. So we talk about, do you even have Wi-Fi? Can you get it where you are, right? So some of it is addressing what we call the social determinants of health. And digital is going to end up being, I think, a, a social determinant of health, just like transportation and education and income and, you know, all of those things, housing, right? I think digital is going to be it, one of those social determinants of health that we're going to have to address. You know, Lisa, I'm going to just say this real quick. I wish I had a banking story, but my bank account doesn't allow me to have a story yet. But uh, <laughs> check back in in a couple of years. I'll have some bank stories, hopefully. Yeah, because what happened is your checking goes to your savings. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting on the on the telehealth, because I have a former a coworker, a former coworker that has muscular dystrophy. And 
originally she, at one time last year, she was going to have to go up to Shands where there's a doctor that specializes in that, but she didn't have the way to get up there, but they were able to flip it to a telehealth appointment. So I was able to at least go over there and sit with her, help her get on with the iPad so the doctor could assess her. But again, it's the fact that she actually had the tools to do that. And yes. so, yes. you know, when we talk about, you know, people, the access and the cost and then the just aversion to technology to begin with, mm-hmm. How we move people forward in that, and so I but think I think so. Your example there, Lisa, that's that's exactly what I'm thinking about when I say that digital as it has the also has the opportunity to start to eliminate some of those disparities because wow. your friend um, would have had to travel, and mm-hmm. and someone with mus- muscular dystrophy has a challenge traveling, obviously, um, and some other folks have challenge with transportation. Maybe it's just because you know it's just expensive or they don't have the time. They got to go to work. You know, um, and so here, this is where digital might be able to come in and say, wait a minute, that trans- we can eliminate that transportation issue. That's no longer an issue. Now, again, we still have the issue of do you have the technology? Do you have the know-how? Do you have the, do you have the literacy, the health literacy, and the digital health literacy to, to engage in that? So those are, all, those are all important, but we may be able to eliminate some of these other disparities or at least, at least address them. So again, there's, there's some pros and cons there, but I think we just have to be thoughtful about how we implement. Yeah. And um, I'm going to flip to when we talk, you know, talk about digital access, one area where we've seen it play out not very well is in vaccinations, the COVID vaccinations. So I want to flip over to Dr. Blue and let's just talk a little bit about some questions around the vaccines. And first of all, what are some of the differences in the vaccines? And we'll start there and then and then continue. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, right now, uh, mainly the virus, uh, the vaccines that are being distributed are from two major companies. One is Pfizer and one is Moderna. Um, Very soon we'll have a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The main thing to know is that uh, between those two uh, companies, the Pfizer or the Moderna one, they have different days that you need to come back for a second dose, but they all both at this point require two doses, all right? So that's very important because a lot of people sometimes think, oh, I got one and this is going to be a one and done. The Johnson and Johnson version, that's not available and that's not the one that you got. So if you've already gotten one, that's not the one that I'm talking about because you did not get that one. Okay, the ones that are given out right now are the Johnson and Johnson and the Pfizer. Okay, so if you got one of those, you need to make sure on your card it will tell you, please return on this date. And they have different days. For example, one of them is three weeks, the other one is four weeks. Okay, and you need to know which one you got so you know when to come back. Okay, those are the main things for right now that people just need to know because that's really been one of the major uh, setbacks, unfortunately, is that people sometimes are just going for one thinking that they'll be okay. And really, what the, it wasn't studied that way. So it's hard for us to kind of give you a representation of, hey, you're really going to be protected if you're really only kind of working on, you know, half of a vaccine. Right. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Blue, can you, can you mix them? So typically, they don't recommend that uh, at this point. You know, uh, uh, that's not something that and, and honestly, at this point, most people in most places that you get, you really won't be able to decide. So typically what happens is that in your area, so whether you're in Hillsborough, Pinellas, um, you know, whatever you go to, you know, the local church. They, they will have the vaccine. So for example, you know, here at Moffitt, the one that we've been distributing a lot of times uh, is the Moderna vaccine. Every, but then the next week or so, the next shipment could be the Pfizer vaccine, okay? So it's not like you show up and, and it's like McDonald's where you say, I want a number three, I want the uh, Pfizer, and then I want the, it doesn't work that way. It's like, hey, um, you know, I'm here, I want my COVID vaccine, this is the one that we have, and, and this is how we should distribute it. Now, have you seen challenges from a standpoint of, okay, people have to go online and register to get them or make a phone call or there seems to be that challenge when we talk about going back to this access issue? That yeah. Would, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Unfortunately, things just haven't been uh, smooth. I'll just say it that way, you know, but, but, you know, it's like that really with anything that's new, you know, there's a little bit of a, 
growing pain and really everybody wants it it's like hotcakes i'm sure you saw on the news there were some people who were um, basically imitating that they were elderly but they really were millennials it's is that i mean when, when have you ever heard of people wanting to get a shot like that like and right so, and, and so that we but but well we know that and they, and not only that but between the vaccines they have different levels that they need to be uh kind of cared for and that the way that the uh, actual vaccines are housed and preserved so so you know th there's things that are very technical with this that um when you try to distribute it and so fast because you know let's just say for example people say you know what let's take our time develop a plan people are like well what's going on in my county why you know why is st pete getting it why is tampa not getting it you know and and so really what happens is that sometimes the public interest sometimes they try to force it out and sometimes they force it out a little bit prematurely and so the the local governments just try to do the best as they can and sometimes we do see that others navigate that better than others and, and it really mm -hmm. does create a problem mm -hmm. and, and talk about some of the the misinformation around side effects. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the main, um, you know, kind of side effect that, uh, you know, honestly, let's, let's, let's step back a second, okay? This really is um, a talk about mistrust, okay? And unfortunately, communities of color, we don't trust nobody. We don't even trust people in our family. So now you got a government that, a lot of people believe has never really been for people of color telling you, hey, I need you to take this, okay? People don't believe that, and, and, and I understand that, okay? Um, but what, what I want, always tell my patients is that, you know, my job is to really review the literature, review the science, review the studies that have been done on it, and give you my opinion on what's going on there, okay? Just like Edmundo was saying, when the ATM was invented, his grandmama didn't want to get money out of ATM, all right. I know my mom growing up, she was still counting the money as it came out of the ATM, like the ATM made a mistake. you right. Whenever there was, um, you know, any new issue that happened, people of color just don't trust it. You know, the Popeye sandwiches came out. People trusted that. But, you know, but but honestly, <laughs> some, but even with that, some people like, oh, y'all eating those Popeye sandwiches is going to leave a, you know, third eye. You know, I mean, whatever. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, anything that comes out, people are going to have something to say. All right. And so what we wanted to do is to have this opportunity really to clear the air and to tell people some of those truths. So um, so really from a, a, a side effect profile, there the, the vaccines have been very safe. OK, there are very certain populations that are what they call at risk of dying from COVID. I don't know if you guys saw, but there's been half a million people that already have died from this disease, right? And so we know that this isn't something that is targeting all the communities equally. And so what they're trying to do is to say, all right, who potentially will die from this, right? Not saying who will get a runny nose or who might get a fever, but no, who will be in the ICU, which is like the critical care unit and unfortunately may pass away. So it's like, well, let's try to give it to that community first because you know, we can't give it to everybody at one time just because of the amount of people and the quickness um, of distribution. So can I, and so, um, it's, it's, whew, there's so much here. There's so much here. So I have a, I have a brother who's an anti-vaxxer, right? And my mom was texting me and she said, you know, you know, your brother's on Facebook telling everybody about how the vaccine, how bad the vaccine is. Now he does not listen to me. I'm the only doctor in the family. He does not listen to me when it turn, when it comes to science. So I love, you know, as as, as Brendan was saying, you know, he's going, he's he's reading the studies, he's understanding the the, the science and the literature, and he's going to make his opinion, um, give his opinion based off of that, based off of a a scientific, academic understanding of what's going on out there. That's just not how everybody else works, though, right? And there's all this Facebook disinformation that's going on out there. But here's here's some here's some more more facts. I mean, getting back into it. It is killing people of color at a disproportionate rate. That five hundred thousand dollar, that five hundred thousand people that have died, is not evenly distributed across our population in the U.S. We're getting hit more, harder, right? And by the way, that's that's unfortunately just the people who died. That's not even counting the people who have current and long term. Um, more what we call morbidity. So, you know, they, they, their, their lungs now, they, 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 they need oxygen now for the rest of their lives. Or, or they had a stroke. 
It causes those things, by the way, right? And so now we're not even counting all the people who are having all these challenges who they lived, but they're still having all these challenges and it's disproportionately affecting our community. So the dis, that means the disinformation that's out there in social media, for example, talking about, um, and, you know, kind of anti-vaccine uh, is disproportionately affecting our community as well, right? And so I think we should, we really should be talking about that. Yeah, I mean, really some of the things that really, um, they say are the most likely reasons to die from the actual virus itself, a lot of people in the minority community have them. So they say, all right, if you're overweight, you're going to have problems. They say, uh, you know, if you uh, unfortunately don't make enough money and you, you, you know, you, you uh, don't have money and poor, you're going to have problems. They say, if you have high blood pressure, you're going to have problems. You know, they say, if you, if you live long enough and you get to be a little bit older, you're going to have problems. Now, those are just one issue. What if you got both of them? What if you say, you know what? I'm overweight. I got high blood pressure. Um, poor, you know, like if you got, you know, it's like those things keep adding up, adding up, adding up. And so, you know, we really came at this as a brand new virus. We didn't have any shield. And so now we're offering some type of shield to potentially help. All right. Not only that, but there's other ones coming down the road. And this isn't something that just happened in America. This is something that happened all over the world. All right. And so it took really everybody kind of working together because honestly, when this thing hit, the world pretty much stopped and, and, and shut down. And so really it allowed people who study viruses, who study uh, what they call infectious diseases, which is kind of the umbrella term for this, is to say, hey, how do we work together? How do we kind of use what information we know and to really roadmap a plan on how to get this out to people, you know, in a short period of time? And that's what was done. And there's actually a question that came in that you addressed somewhat of are people of color experiencing higher rates of COVID due to genetic issues or is it more environmental? So I don't know if you want to add to that from what you just said. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's hard to know uh, if it's, uh, you know, it's always the question in life. Is it nature versus nurture, right? And there's no way to know that up front, but it seems to be that we have been put in an environment that really has led to us, you know, because COVID is just one slice of the minorities do worse in pie. You know, you could take, you could substitute COVID with colon cancer. Oh, minorities do worse in colon cancer. You could substitute that with breast cancer. Oh, minorities do worse in breast cancer. You say, oh, who dies from heart attacks? Oh, minor, you know, so COVID is just, the, and so to say that it's genetic, I, like I said, it is, I, you know, there's no studies on that, so I can't say no but it just seems to be just another layer of problems that is affecting our community that we need to kind of be strong about because if not, it's taking us out and, yeah. and we can't really afford that. I, so I, you know, 100% on it. So, you know, the, when I'm a health services researcher and we call, we call that umbrella term of the fact that certain, uh, certain uh, illnesses and outcomes from healthcare in health are just affect us, affect people of color worse. We call that social determinants of health. So it's not the underlying, like what's going on in your body necessarily. It's all of your environmental stuff that's going on. It's, you know, the fact that you live in a food desert or it's the, again, it's the, back to that transportation. It's back to that education. It's back to redlining, right? And you know, all, you know, all the different Im impacts, right? All of these things actually are, are impacting. They're structural the structural challenges that are affecting your health, right? And, and once, and once they, to, to Dr. Blue's point, once they start all adding up, you know, then the outcomes. Every time something something new comes down the road, it's heart disease, it's it's cancer, it's all these things. It's all going to be it's all going to be worse. The social the social determinants of health, what they call it now. Uh, I'm going to be a little controversial here, maybe, but in my opinion, as a health services researcher, the actual underlying driver of social determinants of health is structural racism. So at the end of the day, and I'm not saying it's any individual person is just being racist, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is your underlying structures, whether they be policies, whether they be, um, uh, um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, just trends and things that the ways that people just kind of act and the way things are they're done and are baked into your society, are, uh, there, there's racism in that, right? That has to be addressed. That's actually the driver of, of many of the social determinants of health, right? If you think about redlining, for example, that's just structural racism, right? That's, I mean, that's what it is. And so, I, I, and so I, I'm, I'm posing that again, maybe I'm being a little controversial, but I'm posing that because I think we need to be comfortable with the idea that that's actually what's underlying things and, and maybe stop dancing around the, the question.
Yeah, you know, I think, honestly, honestly, Edmundo, I think the issue, too, is that a lot of people, when they say, they say, well, why don't minorities trust health care? And I think they should flip that around is, what is health care doing to earn the trust of minorities, you know? And really, you know, you, we have people who are millionaires, like Serena Williams, going into the hospital, having a baby, and about to die from having a baby, you know, something that's natural that's been happening from the beginning of time. And so it's it's really, we having problems in our healthcare system, you know, and we really know that unfortunately it's not equal, all right? And so, you know, what we do, and I, and I appreciate the USF um, Black Alumni Association for really talking about this, because really we gotta let folks know that, hey, you might see an advertisement or a, a, a commercial about something that might ne not, not necessarily apply to you. All right. You could potentially get that much worse. You could potentially not be able to have the actual resources or it just might be something that just has a different effect in someone like you. And really, um, that's something that has to change, but really doesn't change until we talk about it and have these type of discussions. Excellent. Thank you. And actually, that was one of the questions, Dr. Robinson. So thank you for that. Just talking about that systemic racism issue that impacts the community and how that has manifested itself in this COVID-19 environment. Uh, there was another question uh, to talk about the concept of herd immunity. And, you know, OK, maybe I don't need to get vaccinated, but if them people over there do, then eventually we'll all be immune. Can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the problem is, and um, this is taking people back to their old days in middle school or in elementary school when you used to go to lunch, right? And there was all these long tables. I don't know how everybody's classroom was, but in public school, this is how it was for me, all right? They had these long tables and you had to choose who you're going to sit with, all right? And unfortunately, what's happened is that people sit next to people who are most like them, okay? And that happens in childhood. It continues on to adult. And so what that means is, is that typically the people in your community are people who are similar to you, all right? Now, if everybody who is similar to you is also not getting vaccinated, what type of community or herd immunity are you going to get, right? It could, again, affect certain communities, right, where they're out there getting it at a, you know, 80 90 percent rate but really you in order to get herd immunity they're expecting it to need at least about 70 to 80 percent of a particular population to get vaccinated all right and that that means like you know three out of every four people all right and so that's just not happening in the minority community and so uh, in order to get herd immunity like i said you got to be able to do it in a point where from a minority group that we're kind of one of the loudest voices and saying hey um we need to do that and unfortunately some people can't wait because herd immunity takes time right so now you're saying oh i'll just kind of put it off but we see what ha happened to people who got exposed right and this was only has it even been, it hasn't even been a, a year yet, really, since COVID really kind of took over nationally, right? So, you know, we thought this was something, you know, the folks in Florida was like, oh, what's going on in New York or what's going on in Seattle? And then as we saw, it slowly started trickling its way and then it's kind of exploded. So we're not even at one year yet in Florida. And already then we had so many people die. So, you know, I, I'm not a person who likes to gamble. Some people like to roll that dice. But when we're talking about lives that could potentially be saved here, we don't have time to wait. Pause. We have um, the question in the Q&A. So now the myth is busted that Blacks don't want to get vaccinated. What should we do to get more vaccination locations in our communities? Yeah, that's a great question too. So, you know, um, I, you know, I'm not a person who knows how to get it to the people, but I think the people know a way to get it to the people. And I think what we need to do is to make sure that we have like community organizers and we, we need to have people in the community having seats at the table, you know? And I think that's been some of the problem is that it's been this very like uh, what we call paternalistic, you know? So somebody telling, hey, I know what's best for you. Or I know how to, you know, you know, get things to the minority community, but really you, you, you're so far removed, you don't really understand how to get it to the people, you know, and, the, and really having the people tell them, say, hey, we know that everybody is on, you know, like, for example, in, in South Side of St. Pete, everybody's on 16th Street. We like, look, you go right here, there's a, there's a, a gas station, a Shell gas station on 18th Avenue, everybody and their mama go to that Shell gas station. And, you know, if you know, if you set up something right there, boom, 
you know, this is what happened when they originally tried to roll out, like, for example, like the, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act through the what they call Obamacare. You know, they really had the communities engaged and say, hey, we kind of know how to sign people up for insurance. Let us kind of have a seat at the table. And, you know, that really took off and was able really to help folks. So similarly, I think we need to, you know, kind of have people because each community is a little bit different. Right. So, like I said, I mean, um, you know, I grew up on the south side of, of uh, St. Pete. But what we did in St. Pete is different what happens here in North Tampa, South Tampa, East Tampa, and even within their own city. West Tampa is different than North Tampa, right? And so you can't just make a blanket statement and say, all right, I'm going to put this in the churches everywhere. That's not, that's not the way this is going to work, right? Because really, that's the issue is, is, hey, we have these, but how do we get what we have to the people? And that's yet to really be figured out. Yeah. Uh, switch back to talking about technology. And there was a question posed earlier about a uh, person talked about purchasing a Garmin watch and it was having trouble reading their stress rate and going to this issue of AI technology and its impact on people of color. We've seen the, the EV, the electronic vehicles that don't respond to certain skin tones in front of them. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, it's it's fascinating. Um, the my theory is, and I think it's being borne out, that artificial intelligence, in some way, shape, or form, and there's lots of different forms. I won't go into all the all the technology technical components of it. Is going to be essentially pervasive throughout, you know, really all your life, but certainly in healthcare. It's just going to be in everything. It's going to be in your how the hospitals run. It's going to be how the clinics run. It's going to be how you interact with your, your, with your docs and your nurses. It's going to be in, in everything. Here's the challenge, though. In order to, and I will get a little technical, in order to, um, let's say, program an, 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 an AI um, um, intervention of some sort, you need a lot of data because the, the AI um, algorithm needs to learn. And you just got to give it a ton of data. Just give it a lot of data so that it can learn how to predict. Because AI, the, the core thing of what AI does is predict the next thing, right? In order to do that, you got to give it a lot of data. The challenge that we found is that that data is not coming from our communities. So when you're programming your, your artificial intelligence, for example, to read, um, uh, to read uh, heart rates through, through a particular type of skin or facial recognition or... Um, uh, to predict the outcome of uh, if somebody has a heart attack. There's not enough data coming in from people of color to train the machine to learn how to predict better with us. So then what we're seeing is that, but, but we got a lot of data and they can't predict, just nobody's coming to us. So now what you're seeing is they're now going out into the market and saying, hey, this thing is ready to go. And then one of us tries to use it like, oh yeah, that don't work, that didn't work for you, oh. We didn't, we, you, oh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't think about you, right? And so now you, you have, you're, you're, we're building now um, things that people are accepting as just, that's just how things work. Facial recognition, that's just how things work. And we're now, and we're after the fact finding out, oh, um, that has a lot of other consequences because that doesn't work in that community. Um, and so in, in general, I'm very interested in this idea of us building bias like that into these kinds of technologies, right? Because again, as I said earlier, when we talk about digital tools, they can be used to address disparities and they can also exacerbate them. And I think in this case, I'm very concerned about, um, you know, these kind of tools like a Garmin watch or a Fitbit or things like that. I mean, you know, great if they work for you, um, but sometimes they just don't. And if you think about, and if you step outside of healthcare just for a sec, if you think about things like facial recognition, Look, law enforcement is using this stuff, right? And, and, and we don't need any more disparities in, law, in, 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 in policing and law enforcement. Right? We got enough of that, right? And so it's, it's going to, the technology in some cases, because I don't think people are really truly um, driving home a approach that address, that, that articulates, that, that speaks to, that's honest about the bias and, and, and comes up with ways to address it. It's not happening. And so again, you're, the technology is going to drive disparities even wider, and that and that's a that's a that's a real I think that's a real concern. And again, there's really wonderful opportunities if we do this well. Think about let's go back to the vaccine for a second. 
you know, part of the part of the the I think one of the big benefits of the vaccine is I think the 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 pharma companies that were they had to do all the development stuff. So they had to go back and do a lot of the development. You know, you know when when the when the pandemic hit, they said, hey, we're going to need a vaccine. We got to go develop it. When they did the when they did the testing though, the initial the initial research and testing, they actually had a pretty diverse group of people in the testing. Way more diverse than it's typical for for this kind of stuff. Trust me. Just is just way more diverse. And so we felt pretty confident um, on the scientific side that when they rolled this vaccine out, because enough people had been tested, including people of color and people in different countries and all that, that it was going to be pretty universal. And that, so that gave us confidence. So then folks like Dr. Blue can come and say, look, I'm feeling pretty confident that this vaccine is for you, right? That is not always happening in technology. And, and again, the, the downstream effects and ramifications of that are still just being seen now. Yeah, so Edmundo, um, basically what that kind of springboards into is uh, things like clinical trials, you know, which there's a huge disparity. So, you know, I'm gonna tell people that if people hadn't heard this before, okay? For any new medicine or anything to come out, we have to test it, right? We can't come out to you and say Tylenol will help your headache unless somebody has tried it out before, okay? And so what happens is, is that we there's different phases of clinical trials, and this is not a, a you know a talk on clinical trials, but I just want to let people know. But really, what we found out is that the people in the minority community, unfortunately, we don't sign up for these trials. So what happens is that these medicines, you know, they get approved. And then when we try to take it, we're like, why is this not working? I, I don't understand. It's similar to this thing that Amendo, Amundo's talking about with the technology. It's the same thing is that we got to do better, right? And so as leaders really in the field of medicine and technology, and we really got to help the people and kind of educate people. That's why we're giving these kind of talks to say, hey, you know, if, if, if an opportunity is open up to you and somebody says, hey, uh, I need you to be part of a clinical trial to kind of help learn about something, you should have that more. There's some communities, they, they, they can't wait. They like, please, please sign me up, right? Because they want to make sure that they're involved in the cutting edge stuff, as opposed to in our community, we, we try to do a better job. But sometimes people use that word guinea pig and say, hey, I'm not letting people, you know, uh, and like I said, the medical community, you know, we, we got some, um, some trust building to do, right? I'm not saying there's no faults there. I'm just telling you that in order for us to know if something's going to work, we got to have the people who we needed to work on get involved early, Right. Not kind of after the fact and saying that things are going to work, because that's really only what we matter of fact, there was blood pressure medicines, for example, blood pressure medicines came out. And, you know, unfortunately, minority communities, we suffer with blood pressure a little bit more than most. And so they basically found out that not the same blood pressure medicine worked better for black people than for white people. They, mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't know that. We didn't know because it wasn't part of the trials. And so it really wasn't until things kind of got really out of whack for us to learn those kind of things. And like I said, because people are dying, because these are some serious topics, we are trying to get people involved early. And that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, it's, it's really important. I mean, you think about, you think about artificial intelligence, intelligence again, because as, as you define it, um, it's, it's again, it just think of it as an algorithm. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't, it shouldn't it be just some black box. It's just, it's all it is is an algorithm that takes data that it learned from before and predicts the next thing. That's, that's all it is. It just, it's, it's a real, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm I know I'm simplifying it uh, for if there's any techie, techies on the, on the call, I apologize, please. Like, you know, but, but that's, I mean, it really, really what it's doing in a lot of ways is it's because it's trying to mimic human interaction is trying to mimic a human interaction right and what it, the way it does that essentially is by trying to figure out what the next thing should be but how do you predict what the next move is going to be if you've never seen the move before right it reminds me of um of um uh, and so i used to play football and um uh -oh, I, wait 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 were you good that's the question wait 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 now wait now wait now hold on we need to know just, did you play you play or you you watch now come on i'm trying to figure out Look, just, let me let me let me just have my moment of glory here for a second buddy come on man all right now, i'm just saying i'm just saying was it next to the water cooler or was you acting on the field i'm just saying look i was i was i was i was six two in the in the <laughs> late 80s playing wide receiver there wasn't a whole lot of us um, that so I, I did I did I all right I did all right let's just say that but I, but but I was saying you know <laughs> I was but what was interesting is right as, as when you're when you're wide receiver 
you got the you got the cornerback guarding you. And if you make a move they ain't never seen before, you gonna end up wide open. Right? You go, you, you they think you're gonna do a quick slam, boom, boom, boom. They've seen that before, too. They, they're gonna get they're gonna get you. The linebacker's gonna hit you too because you're in the middle. But if you do that up, up, now I'm going outside, they ain't never seen that that double move, you wide open. Right. And that and that's what that's what that's what happens. If you're not, if we're not part of these these early um, 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 assessments of how this technology or how these studies work and how this intervention, like a like a clinical trial, like a medical intervention work, if we're not a part of that, then it's never seen it before, then we're gonna be lost at the end of the day. And we're gonna we're not gonna be able to take advantage of the opportunity that's coming down the line. Right. So when when artificial intelligence is trying to predict the next move and it's never seen a person of color in its database before, it can't predict that move because our move might be different because our communities are different. The underlying structural institutional components are different. Um, there are genetic differences. All of those things are, are you know, might be true and they all play together. And, and, and it's never been seen before. So that's why that that garment didn't work. It's never seen that skin tone before. Right, it's just just like just like that cornerback never saw that double move that I got him. I got that TD on him. Yeah, TD. Yeah. I, I, I don't know now. Hold on, now. hold on, hold on, hold on now. All right, I, I, I we're gonna YouTube you at Ed, Mundo Robinson. All right, all right, we're gonna see. <laughs> and so, how do we make sure that we get into these spaces? You know, making sure, like Dr. Boo talked about, that we're present in these studies. And I know, you know, full disclosure, I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor and part of a local organization. We try to make sure our, our survivors get in, get active in these studies because it's always when things come out about breast cancer, it's, I'm always reading it, it always tested on this group. You know, it, we didn't focus on the triple negative and some of the, the more severe outcomes that we have as black women. So how do we on this IT side and this telehealth, artificial intelligence, health innovations, and even in the work you're doing, Dr. Blue, in oncology, make sure that we are represented. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say two things from my standpoint. This this is this is super helpful. Okay, number one is you have to ask, right? When you go to your doctor and you say, "Hey, I want to be in a clinical trial," most of the time that doctor is gonna say, "All right, let's find you something," because that's what other groups do. And number two we have to make sure we tell other people about it. So in our community, unfortunately, if we got cancer, we got, you know, we don't know why big mama died. We just know she fell asleep. You know, she died at old age when she was 65. That, that don't, you know, like we, we are so um, conditioned to really just not being open to our family members and talking to them about what's happening and what's going on. Because, you know, as, you know, younger generations are coming along, you might say, you know what? I might want to be a part of some clinical trial or something that happened because I know that's what my mama had. That's what my grandmama had. And I want to prevent myself from having it, but you will never know unless y'all talk. Excuse me. Go ahead, Armando. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's right. Also, I think that's, that's what, that's absolutely one. So you just, we just, you gotta, you gotta have the conversation. You gotta, you gotta, it's gotta be on the table. The other thing I'm thinking as well, and I think this gets back to something Dr. Blue said, which is, um, you know, the, that the healthcare system has a role. It has to build that trust. I think the community has to hold us accountable to that. Um, I think we got to hold us accountable to making sure that we have diverse membership in our clinical trials. Hold us accountable to making sure that we had diverse members as we build some of these, some of these um, digital algorithms, AI algorithms, all that. We need to be held accountable. So I think it, I think it, goes, I think it goes both ways. I, I, we can't discount that lack of trust and so how do you start to break down the, those barriers between, between the community and, and the healthcare system? Also, too, I want to just let people know, um, you know, if people don't see it in the, in the chat box, you know, you can always call us here at Moffitt, right? Moffitt is one of the re big resources we have here in Florida that are doing clinical trials and research that a lot of people don't have access to. And it's right here in your front, front door, your back door. So the number that you, if you don't see it is one 456 two eight three nine and if you say hey i'm interested in a clinical trial we'll tr probably find something for you okay we even sometimes have clinical trials for people who don't even have cancer yet they have what they call pre-cancer and we're trying to figure out well which people when they have pre-cancer 
how do we prevent them from actually turning into cancer? So don't think that, oh, I don't have breast cancer. I don't have colon cancer. I don't have prostate cancer. We're trying to figure out things up front to help things down the line. So, so really, I want to encourage people to do that because we are a huge resource. And we're, we, you never know what's happening unless you either Google it, which I encourage you. People say, don't Google. You Google. All right. And if you got questions about it, you ask somebody. All right. But don't just say, oh, I don't know. I don't know nothing about that. You know, it's like, look it up. All right. Ain't no reason why, you know, we don't have no access to at least try and look something up. All right. They used to say it, it, it's in books, which, you know, we unfortunately didn't have that. But pretty much, mo you know, we have an idea to get to Google. All right. And then, like I said, call one 888 Four six five two eight three nine, and we'll help you here at Moffitt to try to get involved in some type of research or clinical trial. And I'm telling you, it'll change not only your life, it'll potentially change your kids' lives, your grandchildren's lives, because what we know now in 2021, we better know much more by 2030. And the only way we're going to know that is through research. Awesome. I had another question that came in about what are some legitimate reasons where someone should be apprehensive about getting vaccine? whether it's uh, pregnancy or certain allergies. Yeah, the devil trying to take my voice today. I won't let him. I ain't going to let you take my joy, but but trying to take my voice. But but really, um, you know, there are, like any new thing, there are people who do have severe allergies, right? So there's some, you know, uh, kids who, for example, you give them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they ended up in the hospital, all right? There's some people, if they get stung by a bee, you know, things that are like kind of normal and out and, out and about, their whole face swells up or their throat closes up. This is no different. This is something that is new, right? And if you know that you are a person, um, there's a special uh, pen that people who have these kind of really high allergies uh, have to carry around. It's called an EpiPen, all right? And these are people who they know that they their immune system allows them to have kind of a exaggerated response, then we say that, hey, if this is something that's new to you, maybe you want to have this under a more controlled environment. And this might be, you might be a type of person where we say, you know what, maybe this is on an individual basis and you and your doctor might need to talk about that uh, because really your immune system is kind of uh, uh, revved up. OK, and we, of course, don't want any bad thing. But like, but that's such a small minority of people that really that's not um, kind of who we're talking to. But for sure, if you have the, if you have to carry around an EpiPen, then you probably want to talk to your doctor about kind of really, is this the right thing for you? And, and, it, and he probably will say, he or she will probably say yes, but it's how we go about doing it. And like I said, it has to be typically in a controlled environment. So Dr. Blue, to your, to your, in, in, to your knowledge, is there any evidence that anyone has died from the vaccine itself? No, 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 no. And, you know, and people and people always think that, you know, um, that there, there hasn't been any evidence of that happening. And so um, but of course, people still don't want to. And so I, I, I'll bring this up too, just as a quick side note. People saw when the first vaccine came out, these uh, pictures of people with what they call Bell's palsy. All right. Which is kind of um, it kind of almost looked like people had strokes, you know, so that the side of their face were kind of droopy and they. Uh, lip might have been drooping. Those are things that happen literally with so many medications. Okay, um, and 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 honestly, the uh, it was only four cases. All right, so so this we're talking about something that has less than a point percent chance of happening, and it's things that are reversible. All right, we treat Bell's palsy. I'm imagine Edmundo all the time. I mean, th these are things that are so common. I don't want the fear of misinformation to really scare people away from something like this. When really this not does not apply to anywhere near the majority. Not even a small small percent of people. So this is something that. I, like honestly, I'm telling you that has been vetted, and the more and more we give it to people, the more people will see that this is really something that's safe. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk numbers on that for a second. So, um, so there's, as far as we know, of the of the hundreds of you know of the thousands, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure how many vaccinations have happened to to date na uh, internationally. Um, there's no evidence that anyone has died from a vaccination. That includes Hank Aaron, y'all. By the way, in case y'all are wondering. Okay. Um, but we know that the evidence is when you, again, we've got, as, as Dr. Blue said, Moderna and Pfizer, the two vaccines that are out right now, J&J is coming um, um, soon. We know that they're saying after you get your second, second vaccination, you're somewhere in the mid 90% uh, 
effective from an immunizing perspective. So mid 90 percent ish, right? That means that you will the that 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 means it's effective means that you did not you will not get COVID, right? So like 90 mid 90 ish percent, right? So 95 percent of effective. Now you're thinking, am I going to be the five percent? Well, here's what happened to the five percent, by the way. So what? Because let's let's talk about that. So here's what happened to the five percent. They got exceptionally mild illness. They did get COVID, but they got exceptionally mild illness. Only one that I know of, and Dr. Blue, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but only one person who got the vaccination and got COVID was even hospitalized. And that person did, did find it and they ended up leaving the hospital. One person out of all the, all the testing. So that means that even the 5%, when they say it's only 95% effective, even that 5% did fine, right? Nobody who's been vaccinated has and got COVID has died from it. So we've got half a million people in the U.S. who've died from COVID. And if you get vaccinated, we have zero. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, and, and really, and that's, that's really the whole point that we're trying to tell people that, you know, that, that trust me, uh, you know, there's some of these fear tactics sometimes I'm telling you can kill you. All right. Lack of information can kill you. All right. So that's why really this information that we're doing here today, hopefully people are listening. Not only are you listening, but you tell somebody about it, because really the whole point of this is to change lives, help lives and save lives. So um, talking about clinical trials and AI, how does AI play a role in clinical trials? And then also, where do you see innovations going? Is there ever going to be a day where I'm like Dr. McCoy, they can just like wave that thing over me and <laughs> you're clearly a Trekkie, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I, you know, that, that one-stop shop type of thing. I'm not, I'm not sure yet, but here's, here's, I can give you a hint of where things going. I can actually start with the, your original question, which is kind of the AI and clinical trials. Here's one thing, or you think about clinical trials, right? So, you know, Dr. Blue really was, you know, making an impassioned plea around making sure that we get, we get more people of color in, involved in clinical trials. It's really, criti really critical. Here's what AI might actually play a role. So, and we're working on this right now, by the way. So this is not, this is not even like future stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna be doing this relatively soon. Where the AI can come into play is the AI can look at all these data and look at uh, the whole list of all the patients that we have in our, in, our, in our database, and then look at all the clinical trials. Clinical trials have what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria. In other words, what type of people should be in and what type of people should be excluded from the clinical trial, right? So the AI will look at all of the inclusion exclusion criteria across all the clinical trials. We'll look at all of the people and then match it. The AI will do it. Like right now we have people doing that, right? People that literally have to remember that trial and then have that list and then remember like who, and then they just go to the clinic like, oh, the doctor said, oh wait, maybe this person. And they, the people are literally, that's how people are doing to run around the clinic right now trying to match people up, right? The AI can do that, right? Because it's a very task oriented type of thing. So that's one way of that, right? We call it clinical trials matching, right? So that's one way right off the, right off the bat, we can start to, and then what if we say, we want to, we tell the AI, we want to specifically target uh, uh, um, people of color in the, for that clinical trial, so we can add, so we can increase our overall diversity of the trial. That's what it can do, right? It goes in there and finds that. So that's that's where AI in the clinical trials, right? You know, again, we'll we'll be doing that relatively soon. Um, but interestingly, where where are things going? What's what's fascinating? And I know I know kind of some of the pathologists and radiologists and pathologists are folks who look at slides all day and look at you know if you if you do a if you if you take blood or looking at a slide or you, or if you or if you do what they call a biopsy right they'll take they'll look at slides. Pathologists and radiologists who are looking at X-rays and, and CAT scans and MRIs and things like that um, ha, have seen AI come in for a while. What why is AI coming for those two especially specifically? Because what AI is really good at is pattern recognition, right? Because again, the whole point of it is that it, it's, it's seen a lot of the same thing and then it can predict the next thing, right? Well, if you're looking at a, a chest X-ray over and over and over again, the AI can jump in there and say, hey, we know what's going on with that chest X-ray. So where things are going is that the AI is gonna start diagnosing things in your, in your, in your CAT scan, in your chest X-ray, in your, in your MRI, on your, on your biopsy, on your blood work, right? The AI will jump and say, yeah, I know what that is, right? That's lymphoma, I've seen that before, right? It'll, it'll start doing that. Now, right now, like, don't, don't get scared. Like, oh, oh there's no, no more doctors. Like, oh, the AI is gonna be doing everything. We're not there yet, 
right? We're not going to be able to just wave and then the AI is going to be able to do everything. We're not there yet. Right now, what it's doing is supplementing the position, right? And, and, and giving an opportunity to back the position up or, or maybe, or maybe here's one example, maybe that the doc looks at something, maybe the, the, uh, maybe the radiologist looks at a CAT scan, you got a CAT scan of the chest, looks at that CAT scan and the radiologist says, okay, this is what we think is going on. The AI can, might come in behind and say, hey, you missed something. Take another look. We think you missed that thing right there, right? And so then the doc says, oh, you're right. I missed that. Let me add that to my list. Or no, you're wrong. That was not really what you think it is, right? So that's one way the AI like really soon can start helping, helping docs. But going down the line, that's where things are. So in, in that area right there, that's where, that's where things are. Let me give you one other example where AI, and this is not going to directly um, affect patients yet, but it, it eventually will. Here's the thing. So there's, if you guys don't know, there's, there's, ten, there's always tension between the healthcare providers, the docs and nurses and so forth and the insurance companies. There's tension between the two because insurance, insurance companies doesn't, don't really wanna, um, uh, they, they don't wanna pay for things that they don't think are, are necessary, uh, are un, that, they think, that they think are unnecessary. And the docs are just trying to do their job and take care of their patients, right? And so when we ask the insurance company to pay us for, for the services that we provided for you, the insurance companies kind of have a whole process. They make, you, they make you jump through all these hoops and it's a whole thing. But what's happening is we're starting to get smarter bring in these AI tools and let the AI deal with the insurance company, not people, right? So the AI goes to the website, submits the claim, um, takes the claim back, resubmits it if it has to, goes through that whole process and there's no people, people are not even involved. So the, so, the, so the insurance company can make you jump through all the hoops you want to, we've got a machine doing it. All right, Amundo, uh, I am expecting the Jetsons from you. Uh, you know, I, I, I yes. told him beforehand that th this, that was my favorite cartoon growing up. So I'm telling you, that's what that's my expectations. I want to see some flying cars. I right. want to see the Rosie the Robot. I want to see, you know, all of those things. All right. Just just so you know. Yeah. I want to see some Roomba, space body Roomba. Exactly. I want to yeah. see it all. <laughs> we have about three minutes left. So I'm just going to let you all make some you know, parting comments. Um, and we'll start with Dr. Blue. Yeah, so, you know, basically in summary, um, you know, I just want to tell folks that, um, you know, if you're listening to this, if you have loved ones, um, really try to see if, you, if you're a candidate for the COVID vaccine, all right? I recommend everybody, even at the very least, to try to get a primary care physician because most people don't even have that, all right? Because you want to talk this over with people who know you, who know your case, all right, because you want to just get vaccinated. It really has been helping peaks. It's been saving lives, okay, because unfortunately, the minority community, we are the ones dying, okay, and so uh, this isn't, you know, the sniffles. This isn't the fever. This is in the ICU, the intensive care unit with a breathing tube and a machine breathing for you, and we're trying to prevent that in our folks, in our brothers, in our sisters, okay, in our cousins, our grandparents, okay, because this is really the uh, community that we see that's having the worst outcome. So, um, so really, um, that's and, and then like I said, if you do get vaccinated, please try to get both vaccines. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're in increments apart. So I, I really do recommend that to happen. We make a lot of jokes and tell a lot of things here, but but this is a serious matter. And I just want to let people know that honestly, um, we're here to help. And of course, here at Moffitt, we're here to help any issues. I said the number plenty of times, but really, um, Moffitt is part of the community, and we're here to help. And uh, just second that uh, for sure. And and I and I want to say, and I and I know I've been um, I've been maybe a little uh, critical and holding it up to a light. All the all the technology that's coming through and all the digital things and so forth. But I'll, I'll be honest, I'm I'm really encouraged and I'm really hopeful about about the the opportunity uh, for technology for digital technology to really help um, help our communities. Um, and really, and really drive forward um, healthcare, and really kind of address the divide, address the disparities, and so I'm really, really hopeful. Hopeful, um, but I will say that there's a role that that you all have to play. There's a role that our communities have to play in that. In that, we've got to hold each other accountable, and we've got to hold our institutions that that serve us accountable for the outcomes that we expect for our communities. And and I think again. Um, an alumni associated in, in, in a Black Alumni Society specifically um, does have that part of that responsibility. Thank you. 
And thank both of you. This has been a really great discussion. And again, the, the number is in the chat for more information to contact Moffitt, 1-888-456-2839. And want to thank both of you once again. This was a great discussion. And thank all of you for joining us. And go Bulls. <laughs> Take care, everyone.